Hi everyone, uh, are you guys hearing me okay? Just want to make sure you can hear me okay. And let's see if. Chat. Can you hear me okay, Virginia? Yes. Okay. So if she can hear me, I'm assuming everyone else can hear me as well. So hi guys, uh, welcome to the latest uh, bridge activity. Um, we're going to be talking about New Zealand today. So the bridge cultures and uh, we're going to be talking about New Zealand. So New Zealand's a, a pretty small country, a relatively young country in the very south of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I'm a native of New Zealand. I was born in the south of New Zealand in a, in a little city called Dunedin. It's a Scottish city and um, it's cold and it's wet, um, but it's quite cute. And there was a few nice days just to remind you that there is summer. So anyway, New Zealand as a whole is, is kind of an interesting place. You may have heard of it already um, because of its natural beauty and also, you know, it's become a little bit more famous over the last few years because of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, everyone sort of knows of it, and because of that, a little, a little bit more. And uh, but I want to share with you today a little bit more of um, the history, how New Zealand became populated, uh, and also I did some research uh, on Facebook amongst you know my Kiwi friends on, on Facebook and asked for their opinions about what they thought uh, best represented the culture of New Zealand. So you know a bunch of friends gave me like five five opinions or five words each and some some were really helpful and others were just joking which is just part of uh, the culture of New Zealand we kind of relatively light-hearted and we don't you know like to take too many things too seriously um, so in that regard it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty pretty natural and, and it was it was nice to get the feedback from everyone there so New Zealand if we look at the slide deck here there's a few national emblems that we have and I want to share those with you guys the first one is the silver fern. So it's a plant that you've seen in different parts around the world, but it's it's a national emblem of New Zealand. And uh, the Maori understood these fronds, this curling or uncurling, unfolding shape of a frond to be something that stood for strength, stubborn resistance, and enduring power. Um, but to the Pākehā, so I'm a Pākehā in New Zealand, that means that I'm of non Maori descent. All of my blood came from Europe, different countries in Europe, primarily uh, the great, uh, oh, the Great Britain, you know, the United Kingdom. So for me, it's really just, it's just, it's for me, it's just the national symbol, and it's something that that uh, that makes me remember home and feel connected to home, and that's sort of typical of most um, Pakihas. We don't typically read too much into uh, the symbolism of it beyond that, really. Um, and a few other national emblems as well. So we've got this flower, which is called the kohai. So it's this beautiful yellow flower on the on the kohai tree. And then this one, when I when I talk, say kiwi to friends, they often laugh and think, ah, oh, you're kiwi, like they think of a kiwi fruit, you know. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a weird one. But no, for us, the kiwi, and we call ourselves kiwis. Um, the kiwi is a national bird, and it's a cute wee guy, and it's kind of Funny, you know, in most countries when they've got emblems, a national emblem of a bird, it's like an eagle or something really huge and powerful. And ours is this little um, blind bird that has a very long nose and sort of only comes out at night. So it's like a really, it's a really different contrast uh, in that regard, you know. So we're not so preoccupied with power, um, but perhaps we're more preoccupied with. Uh, with just making our way around relatively quietly, but just doing our thing. So we don't tend to make a lot of noise, which is a bit of a trait of, of, of Kiwis. So actually, historically, um, you know, everybody knows the Māori, 
the Murray people as being the indigenous people of New Zealand. There was actually another another race or group of people before the Maori that were there, and they were called the Moriori. And perhaps some of it similar in appearance, you know, and these photos obviously represent quite 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 beautiful. Um, but the Maori came along and from what I understand, they, they pretty much just wiped them out. And so then the Maori became really the, the indigenous people of New Zealand. And this this migration or this arrival of the Maori into New Zealand happened about 1,200, so about about 800 years ago kind of thing. Um, so not, not so far in the past. For example, if you watch the Australian presentation, you know, there's probably mention of the Aborigines in Australia. It being the longest uh, cons consecutive living sustained culture. So they've been around between the 40 and 60,000 years, which is really different from what we see in New Zealand. So New Zealand, the environment and the peoples have been there for a much shorter period of time, or particularly the peoples in this regard I'm talking about. And the arrival, from what everything indicates, was pretty much like this. Um, and it's funny here, you, you tend to think that it's only the men represented in these things, but I, I guarantee that there must have been women among the men as well, because otherwise the men just get there and then the population dies. So, um, but these are called fight walkers. And uh, these these boats, these canoes, basically you paddle along and you take, you know, a long time to get across the oceans, particularly this, the Pacific Ocean, which is a huge ocean. So guys, I should also say, feel free to ask questions during it. Um, I hope my earpiece is working correctly. So if you want to say a hello, just let me know that your microphone and my earpiece is working okay, that would be a help. And feel free to ask any questions, okay? So these walkers are, uh, are part of our, our heritage and our culture. We, we still have these, and it's perhaps interesting, uh, you know, if you look at Chinese dragon boats, they're probably very similar in nature, um, perhaps not quite as sturdy or as so on as these ones, but perhaps you'll see from this next slide, there might be some joint sort of historical past there. So um, you can see here, and uh, I've just become illuminated obviously, uh, you can see here that we had a flow of, of peoples leaving from around the Taiwan, the Chinese coastal area, passing through the Philippines, and then spreading out through Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia, the different islands. Some going up to Hawaii, others going over here, right to the Easter Islands, others being over Tahiti, the Cook Islands, and then about, as I said, AD 1200, 1200, um, arriving in, in Aotearoa. So New Zealand is a, a Aotearoa is another name for New Zealand. And this is, these are the three main islands of New Zealand. Uh, it also consists of a bunch of others. You'll see in the south, there's a massive mountain range that runs the length of pretty much the South Island. And there's all these lakes. And so a lot of the beautiful footage and photos that you may have seen in New Zealand, and that I'll even show you here, come from around these lakes. And it's spectacular. And there's also, this part down here is called Fiordland. So there's fjords as well. And it's just, it's really beautiful country. So. Uh, it's like the whole place is like a big garden, you know. You can go in some countries and you drive for hours and you, there's really nothing particularly interesting to see. Not trying to belittle anything, but sometimes it's just like that. In New Zealand, it's sort of every moment you're driving around up and down the west coast, for example, and every moment you're just looking around going, wow, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. So it's, it's, it's kind of unique in, in that regard, I think. So we have the Maoris landing in New Zealand, and then we have um, Europeans. So the Dutch East India Company was operating up in Indonesia, and one of the guys associated with that, this guy called Abel Tasman, he was the first guy who hit New Zealand or found New Zealand, at least from a European perspective, at least that we know of. Um, and that was in around 1642. So as I said, he was a Dutch guy, and his name is used for a number of oceans and seas and uh, even regions within New Zealand as well. But the Dutch, it seems they weren't too captured by the place. They thought, oh yeah, okay, and then they just went, went back and didn't come back again. Really what, what stuck was when J James Cook, who's an English sailor, adventurer, explorer, he reached New Zealand in 1769 on board uh, the Endeavour, if memory serves, and he did a circumnavigation of New Zealand, he mapped it out more accurately and precisely, and 
really it was the English who from that time on started to um, migrate slowly at first. It was more explorers, whalers, gold miners, these kinds of things started to try to go to the country and, and take advantage of some of its resources. But obviously there was a little bit of um, conflict or encounters with the local people, the Maori. Virginia, just a note, please do tell me if someone says something and I just want to, I haven't heard anything yet from through that earpiece. So, uh, so James Cook, 1769, he was the guy who got there and um, from then on things started to flow a bit more. Um, just looking at the name New Zealand, uh, and it's been great putting this presentation together because I knew some of it but I didn't know a lot of other facts as well so it's been good for me. Uh, Zealand is actually a place in, in Holland, it's a province in Holland and so the naming after Tasman and, and the group um, it originally wasn't the original, original name, um, but the cartographers in Holland were changing from like Staten land to sea, to Zealand, um, which translates to sea land, so I didn't know that, and obviously that, you know, we're surrounded by water where we've become very good sailors, it was always a major part of, of life there. So, but also just looking at the Maori name, which has got a beautiful name, Aotearoa, uh, and that's cool. The translation basically comes out as land of the long white cloud. So basically it gives you a, a clue about what the weather is like there a lot of the time, particularly in the south and in the mountains or in Dunedin where I, where I came from. There's plenty of, of clouds and, and rain as, as a few of my friends will, will know very well. Um, so just a little joke because sometimes I've asked, you know, why, why are you born in New Zealand? You know, like, what's the story? And uh, a guy one time made a bit of a joke that sort of stuck in my mind. And, um, you know, Zealand, Z E E, uh, whereas we use Z E A land. And if you look at it, this the change, it became, well, it now spells Zeal, Zeal land. And Zeal, if you look at the dic dictionary definition, means basically you know, great energy or enthusiasm for a cause or objective and the guy made this joke about me and say yeah okay so I've got a lot of enthusiasm and energy for some objectives and they go okay yeah that's quite cool I like that but even looking back at those who migrated to New Zealand right back at the very start you could say that they had a lot of zeal as well because it took 100 days on a boat to travel from England to New Zealand. So it was like a major commitment. And the people who migrated to New Zealand, they were they were free. It was their choice. So it wasn't like, you know, that was imposed and you were you were being exported from your book country or sent out. No, it was that was a free choice. So you can sort of say that oh well actually the name actually goes quite well for even for the early settlers in New Zealand. And here's an example of a poster that was you know, published in, in the UK and they're basically advertising, you know, if you're going to go and work on, if you're interested in working on a farm or becoming a mechanic on a farm in the rural area, so the farmers in the rural uh, community in New Zealand has always been really, really strong. Um, the cities are becoming stronger now, but historically that, you know, good down to earth kind of folk that you get from farming communities has been really strong in New Zealand. So um, you can see here, if you were and you wanted to go to New Zealand, you could basically get a free ride over there and um, and set up your life, go ahead. Obviously nowadays, it's a whole lot of <laughs> rigmarole and barriers to migration and you've got to have skills and you've got to pay your own way, you know. Uh, I'd prefer if things actually opened up even more, I think it would be better for uh, people for the communities, for for all the economy of the whole world actually. If you, it's a different line of thought, but if you look about free borders and the free movement of people, economically it's a win and all the fear that this nonsense politicians are talking about these days actually goes out the window if you look at facts. So, you know, anyway, a bit of an aside. I know I won't win any elections with that came with those policies, but I don't care. I just like the idea. So um, a little bit more of the history of New Zealand. So this picture here in the background there 
you know, it's a picture of, of uh, depiction of the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, the Treaty of Waitangi was an official document signed between the English settlers in 1840, on the 6th of February, and the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maoris. Uh, it actually preserved a lot of their rights and, and so on. Um, but it is, it's a bit polemic and it's still controversial until today, you know. But I think there's been a reasonable amount of good that has come out of it. And I know there's been a lot of tribes in New Zealand who have received a good chunk of, of money, albeit belatedly and perhaps not everything that they could claim or deserve. But um, it's what I suppose together we, collectively we can afford and it goes well and they can invest it well and, and get good income off the thing. But anyway. So the treaty was a really important document that sort of was, I suppose, aiming to try to end any conflicts between the Maoris and the people who were settling in New Zealand. It didn't really work out that well. There was a f still wars for about another 30 odd years. Um, but it's something that in more recent times, in my lifetime even, um, it's been worked on more and promises have been lived up to more, which I think is a good thing. Um, you'll see from the colonial point of view though, you know, like you can imagine at that time there was a massive loyalty to the empire. So when I say the empire, I mean the British Empire, you know, the Commonwealth and so on. And there are a lot of Victorian values, so you know, they'll stiff up a lip and, you know, have a good cup of tea and and maintain, uh, maintain appearances and all that kind of stuff. A lot of conformity, a lot of repression. Um, and you know this whole thing for the glory and the honor of the empire. So colonization at that time probably wasn't the nicest of ties, but I think New Zealand's really moved on a fair bit. Um, not perhaps as much as we, we could or should, but uh, you'll see that conservative kind of tendency still exists in New Zealand, but with each new generation and with each older generation dying, we're starting to see more and more renovation and more and more changes um, which I think is a positive thing. You know, I think you need to be dynamic in life and in relation to these things. So it's, it's good to see. So here on the right is the, uh, the insignia, the formal representation of New Zealand. And on the left here on the bottom is the New Zealand flag. So you can see a couple of commonalities here. You can see the four stars. And so I'm here in Brazil at the moment and we still see the Southern Cross, we still see these four stars, um, but obviously, you know, you've got this, this legacy uh, connection with, the, with Great Britain, and so hence you've got the Union Jack there. Um, looking over here on the, on the insignia, you've got, you know, you've got both the Maori, the English people, and you've got obviously a white-skinned lady, so that's sort of really representing the English, the British side of things. You've got the Crown, so yes, we were like, we're still under the Queen, which people like to tease me about, and I'm not particularly impressed about because, mate, sorry, but you know, the monarchy is good for PR, that's sort of about all they do these days. But in terms of actually doing something constructive, you know, it's, it's not, not a great deal, in my opinion. But anyway, you know, probably the boats represent a lot of uh, water. We're an island nation, we came by ships, we worked a lot with ships. I think the farming, the farming and the agricultural stuff is represented really strongly here, and I guess also the industry and the hard work, which is part of it because we went to a new place and we, we created a new nation there. Well, I'm not saying we as in me personally, maybe, but I don't remember, but I, I think not. Um, but a new nation has been created through hard work and a lot of sweat. I have a question on yeah. monarchy. Virginia. Here's a question about monarchy, no surprise, let's hear it. <laughs> I, I would like to know, um, okay, I would like to know uh, if the monarchy disappeared, disappears in New Zealand, what do you think will be the, the effect in the, in the people? the habitants of New Zealand, the monarchy. Yeah, there's been, um, and as, as in Australia, there's been, uh, there's been, there is a Republican trend, so to be liberated and be, be free of the monarchy, I think it's coming. Uh, it will happen inevitably, I think, with time. Uh, it's just it's going to be a natural progression. I think at the moment, there's still a few older generations who still feel very connected to it. But I think when it does happen, it'll be a really quite a natural and smooth transition. I don't think it'll really mean a lot. Uh, one of the concerns, 
has been, for example, the highest court that we usually can appeal to is the Privy Council, which is based in London, you know. But I think as we mature as a nation, as we mature and we grow, I think we'll assume all those responsibilities quite quite easily. So I don't, in effect, it really doesn't, the monarchy for me in my lifetime, I remember seeing the Queen or someone driving past in the big car when I was a wee kid, but there's really no real, at least for me, speaking personally, there's no real meaning, there's no real um, consequence of, of it. And I think probably for many of my generation, it's like that. It's like, sort of, who cares? But we've got to respect that other generations really, particularly, for example, those who fought in the war, they, they often fought for the, the wars, they fought for the British Empire, they fought for the UK. They were, their parents were from there, kind of a thing. They feel very connected to it. Um, but just naturally with time, that just, that just goes away, in my, in my view. And you see even other countries who have had monarchies for very long times in Europe, they've got rid of them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a natural tendency. Um, you know, I think, and I think it's a positive thing as well because uh, a lot of people can be submissive to it. You know, you're a subject of, you're submissive to, I think that's a, a trait that exists among peoples that it'll be better once it's gone, you know, in my view. So anyway, but that'll happen at, at, at whatever time. Uh, okay, so, and guys, I've got, I've got a few concerns here that I'm not hearing anyone. So, if you need to do just unmute and say a hello or ask a question or type it in the chat and hopefully I'll be able to catch that as well. No, there's no questions. There's no questions? <clears throat> so, a bit more history. Um, as I said, the Murray is still from there around 1200. Hayward Tasman and James Cook before he went over, the Treaty of Whitehead went on over. So actually the, the musket wars, um, and this is into tribal wars, and so this is kind of a common thing that people who were, countries who were colonizing other countries did. They got one tribe or one group to fight against the other group of natives, and then that makes it easier when you come in, you don't lose so many soldiers because they've already killed half of each other. So my guess is that some bright spark thought it was a great idea to give guns to one group, let them start shooting the other group, another tribe, Murray tribe, and then they'll start giving guns to that other group and they'll shoot back and then decimates the native population. And then from uh, 1845 to 1872, there was the British versus the Murray, there was New Zealand wars. So happily that phase ended and uh, we got to the 1890s and there was a parliament and this is something that I, I have a lot of pride about, I'm really proud of New Zealand, there's a few things that the parliament has done over the years. Um, for example, New Zealand was the first country to give women the vote. So in 1893 they gave women the vote. In 1898 they actually gave a pension to old people as well to help the oldies survive and, and make do, uh, which is a really progressive kind of a thing. So these things, among others, um, actually, uh, and this is a fact I didn't know previously, New Zealand became got a reputation for being the social laboratory of the world, which I think is fantastic. Um, we, you know, so we have an advance on every front, as you can see here. The last point here is self-governing, the millions we were self-governing, but still within the British Empire, which isn't isn't all bad, but you know, it's probably time to, to move on in some ways. So as I was saying, we gave, uh, or the, the woman, were, woman were given the vote on the 19th of September 1893. Uh, we're the first major country to greet each new day. Uh, Richard William Pearce was one of the first people to fly on the 31st of March 1903. So for anyone in America who's watching this at any time in the future, your stuff about the Wright brothers really should be a little bit more heavily critiqued, uh, a little bit less marketing, a little bit, little bit, a little bit more criticism because it seems you weren't the first. And there's another guy here in Brazil who also uh, would like to be renowned for, for being the first person to fly as well. Which was what's his name? Dumont. Yeah, Saintus Santos Dumont. Saintus Dumont. So uh, anyway, 
just a wee, a wee plug there. Uh, Earth Rutherford, so New Zealand's are you really, are really creative and inventive. Right, well, we had to be, we had to invent things out of nothing. Ernest Rutherford, he was the first person to split the atom in 1919. And Sir Edmund Hillary, so here's our sort of our outdoors tendency, our connection with nature. He was the first person to climb Mount Everest with Sherpa Tengzing in 1953. Um, I love jet boats. I, I, don't, I try to get a video of one. They're out there on the YouTube, but I didn't in, include them in, in here. Um, but they're great. I've got a picture on the slide soon. So the guy Bill Helmer created a uh, water jet propelled boat in 1953. Um, New Zealand, we're still one of the least, world's least populated countries, so we don't have a lot of people, and we've won more Olympic gold medals per capita than any other country. So you could say we're the greatest sporting nation on earth, <laughs> which makes me laugh if no one else. <laughs> uh, I think we're around four and a half million, kind of thing. Four and a half, maybe getting up to five soonish. Um, and actually, well, another thing that in my lifetime happened. And which I think is, was great, I loved it at the time, and I still am a massive uh, supporter of it, is that New Zealand is a nuclear free zone. Um, there's no nuclear power in New Zealand, and New Zealand does not allow nuclear weapons or nuclear powered vessels in our territory. And that was done, in, I think, in the uh, 1990s, if I remember, early 1990s or, or mid 1980s, I don't remember, we'll find out on another slide. Um, but this is excellent, and there's a lot of pressure against New Zealand to, to, to not do this. So we stood up, we maintained our principles, and we said, no, nah, that's the way it is, so respect for that. A few different things about New Zealand. Uh, I've already talked about one bird that don't, doesn't fly, but we've got lots of birds that don't fly. Um, and the reason for that is, is that there was nothing that ate them. So, you know, if you're not being eaten, and then why do you need to fly? I mean, I can just walk and eat here and I'm fine. I don't, you know, need to fly. So they lost the ability to fly. So that just shows you how isolated New Zealand was from a physical perspective. Um, obviously with the introduction of different peoples there, you know, there's now predators that do eat the birds that don't fly. So we've got to take good care of, of them to, to maintain their populations. And I've just lost. Okay, you guys have it, but I lost the screen here for some reason. So I'm going to turn around and look here now. Um, so we've also got a living fossil from the dinosaur age. The, from the dinosaur age, it's called a tuatara. So it's kind of like a lizard, but it's actually uh, what is called a tuatara. Uh, and also, um, another thing there is that New Zealand is on a fault line, so. We get a lot of earthquakes and a lot of geothermal activity. Historically, there was a very beautiful, lot of quite famous things called pink and white terraces. So really quite large and beautiful, different coloured terraces. Um, and what happened was there was an earthquake and they were destroyed. And a lot of other things have happened in New Zealand with related, related to earthquakes, even quite recently. Uh, one of the major cities there had a huge number of a series of earthquakes and it's actually on the Canterbury Plains, and Christchurch is the city, and the whole centre was pretty much demolished, but no one actually anticipated that there was like fault lines running right under the centre because it was just sort of flat. Um, it was, it was oh, good. Chat. Let me have a look at the chat. Well, take a commentary from no poisonous insects. Yeah, no poisonous insects, and it's just poisonous humans sometimes, mate. <laughs> So, no poisonous insects or animals, right? Like, um, we have uh, we had no spiders, no snakes, no poison, nothing that would hurt people. So, there has been, with importations and, you know, cars coming in from other countries, there has been now some, uh, like, uh, white-back spiders, or I think they're called white-back spiders. Yeah, so they're dangerous. But beyond that, there's still nothing. So you can walk around pretty much anywhere, and if you hurt yourself, it's really your own fault. It's not like something got you. Well, there are wild pigs there and stuff as well, but, you know. So compared to Australia, which is our closest neighbour, really, major neighbour, like there's this whole lot, there's 18 of the world's most 20 poisonous, venomous insects and animals are in Australia, and we've got none. So it just shows you, even though the proximity, we're far enough away that that they weren't able to fly there or get there or manage to get there. So, 
Um, and in New Zealand, right, we recently had this massacre in Christchurch, that city I was just talking about, and actually, uh, I was there just the other week, I got redirected on a flight, finally. And anyway, we had a massacre there in a mosque, and um, there's an Australian guy who was living in New Zealand, and he just went there with sort of semi-automatic guns and killed a lot of people, which was disgusting, but it happened. But we've already changed the gun laws around it, which is something I'm really proud of, and I think is fantastic. And you compare it with a place like America, where they've had 94 shootings and massacres and mass shootings, and there's no magic gun law change. And of those 94, and there's probably others but, you know, on smaller scales, but 46 of those have been in schools. And America still doesn't change, so it's kind of, it's kind of like crazy. But anyway, so it shows a good thing about New Zealand, and, and by comparison, not such a good thing about America, at least in my view. Now, New Zealand, as I said before, it, it uh, has been the social laboratory of the world, and even um, the most recent government we have there, which is a Labour government, uh, they've done a, a budget. Once every year, the government does a budget, we're going to spend on this and that and so on, and uh, never really, never in the history of the world really does the government care a lot about well-being explicitly. But in this government, they explicitly stated, you know, like, we want this to be the well-being budget, everything has to be focused on making life better for people, which I applaud, I think is great. Older generations complain, may complain bitterly about, some do. Um, but I think it's great, and I think it actually reinforces and continues this, this idea of being the social laboratory of the world, you know, not being a slave to just money, but being something more uh, like humane. So here we go, a little bit, a little bit of our reputation. Um, we're quite well known for adventure sports and radical sports. And actually, I didn't think of this, but I can say that each of these three things that are represented here, I have done. Um, I didn't jump off this particular place, but I jumped off a bridge, and I really wouldn't recommend doing it to anyone else. Like I had a headache, I had to stop driving and sit down afterwards and just lie on the grass for like half an hour. Didn't wasn't the greatest for me, but some people really like it. Uh, shot up a jet, the jet boat, so this is an example of the jet boat, love it, do it any time we can. Uh, and rafting as well, I really love, um, haven't done it a lot, but, uh, but love it. But New Zealand is very sort of renowned for this adventurous nature, getting out and trying different things and doing different things. Maybe we need to because there's not enough of us there and it's, some people might think of the place is a little bit boring, but for me it's, it's just the right rhythm and, and, and style of life, so. Can't complain personally. There's a question from Heidi. Mm. What do you mean by in secrets every new day? You, can, you, you say that every day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to go to the future, go to New Zealand, I, I can say. So why is that? I'll explain. Um, the International Dateline passes down through the Pacific Ocean. And so the first country that gets, you know, wakes up for every new day is actually in New Zealand. So the international date line it passes down through the Pacific. And so, you know, for example, when year 2000, or well, everyone was worried about, in year 2000 is going to tick over, one of the countries they watched really closely was New Zealand because there's systems and things there that were in lots of other countries as well. So it ticked over, ticks over there first, so 12 p.m. midnight, the first major country in the world that it happens in is in New Zealand, so we start the new day, so that's why. So, you know, you joke, you, I joke, you know, you go, you go to New Zealand, you go to the future, uh, which, you know, it's true, so what can I, what can I say? Like, like said here, you like, maybe. Yeah, look, uh, I think the tectonic place thing is an interesting thing to look in this regard. If there's a, uh, the question was, if you didn't hear, was, is there a major chakra in New Zealand, like an energetic chakra, a vortice? Um, I think if you look at the tectonic planes, it's an interesting thing because that generates a lot of energy, a lot of movement, a lot of not only physical energy in the ground, but also in the environment. So there's a lot of energies, a lot of volcanoes, a lot of stuff, and so there's probably a lot of activity related to the Serenissimus in those kinds of regions because of that. Um, but in terms of a chakra, chakra, like in Covent Garden or here in, in Fosdabasu and Siayak, I don't know, I'll 
We'll see if we find one. So a few um, a few values that New Zealand has. So you know we wouldn't look at the culture and, and what what do we think about things and how do we go about things. Um, I think it's fair to say we have an appreciation of nature. We've all, I've always had a, a really a lot of an outdoor lifestyle. Um, I think Kiwi's value authenticity. Like we, we like people who are honest and trustworthy, and you know what's going on. Um, creativity and innovation, I think, is a real part of our, our culture as well. Um, we value democracy. We've got a real do-it-yourself attitude, and this is something I can laugh about in myself. Because if you look at do-it-yourself, independence, and um, and so on, like you just we tend to, and this isn't, you know, I have, on another slide where I asked, uh, I got a little feedback from what my friend said. Some, one guy said, uh, I thought quite intelligently, he said, look, there's two kinds of groups. There's people who do it for themselves, who are absolute leaders and make things happen, and then there's another group who is like, it's do it for me. Like, they just want to go along for the ride, they don't want to roll up their sleeves, they don't want to make the effort. So, you know, I'm not saying this is, represents everyone, um, but it's it's probably good, generally accepted uh, tendencies on the whole. So we have good humour, I think, fair to say. We, we, we like laughing um, about pretty much anything, ourselves included. Uh, we work hard. I think, you know, we, we have a good sense of multiculturalism. I don't think we're not as... Um, we're not as good with this as we should be and we need to be, but that's just a learning thing on everyone's side. I think it'll come. You'll see on this other slide I'll show later, there's actually the word racist there. So one of my friends had it. He said racist or she, I can't remember. Racist and then question mark. And, uh, and I think it's fair to say it's a hard thing to admit, but I think there is still um, uh, racism, racism there. Not perhaps, I'm not trying to make it a, an excuse, it's probably not to the degree that you'll see in many, many other places, um, but I think it still exists in, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we're very practical. We are tolerant of, of other religions. In fact, New Zealand's not really a very religious place, so we don't, I don't think, in general, we don't really care much um, on that particular regard. We like, you know, keep our feet on the ground and being practical about stuff, and, and religion doesn't really fall into that category, although we do like ethical, honest stuff, which you know, some rich people are are, uh, are known for those kinds of things. Not everyone, obviously. Um, and we have a bit of a subdued patriotism. So, you know, like, we're proud, but we're not, like, show off you proud, and we don't really rant and carry on a lot about it, um, even though I've made a few jokes in this presentation. But, um, you know, it's we're not, we're not that wound up in ourselves about things. It's usually out of, a, out of a joke or a laugh more than anything we, we get like that. Um, so just a bit of a visual show, you might already recognise some things here. I can ask you what was the name of this flower here, this yellow flower, who remembers? So close. Kohai. Kohai. And of this little bird up here, Kiwi, yeah, okay, too easy. Uh, so there's the things here that for Kiwis, you almost laugh about a lot of these things. Like this, this thing over here, it's for tomato sauce. Right? Like it's, <laughs> it's just the classic Kiwi thing. I love it, but I've got one at home. Um, and so on. So you've got uh, you've got all these kinds of, of things that for Kiwis, they recognise a lot of these things. Um, so here's the thing, uh, on the 10th of October on Facebook I sent out, you know, Mr. Jack, Kiwi friends, tell me what you think, you know, describe New Zealand culture. And so here was all the words that came back. Some are just joking, like I think there was, I think I took, I don't know, there was, I think one guy wrote rugby, rugby, cricket, rugby, cricket, rugby, Casey, that's you. Um, and so I didn't really repeat that too much, you know, I took a few different takes on it. But there's some lovely things in here, and there's also some things, you know, that, that are um, to be confronted, to be recognised, admitted, and see, well, you know, perhaps um, we should do something to change here. If there's anything here that catches your attention, let me, 
let me know in the chat if there's anything you want to talk about there. Some of these words. There's another slide that's coming up which will we'll go into some of these words. Like uh, if anyone knows my work in, within these sciences that we're studying here and so on, like you know I, I work with a lot of new words. And you'll see in New Zealand, uh, we, we create a bunch of new words ourselves and new expressions. So it's a little bit of a thing, much, usually much more casual than scientific. But uh, but this is quite uh, this is quite nice. One of the ones I really loved was um, the one that made me look up on the dictionary. What is mana, mana kitanga? I didn't know that. I probably didn't pronounce it correctly. But it's uh, it's a Maori word for kindness. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of nice traits here, you know. Like, but here's you know, there's it's interesting to see the feedback, you know. Like narcissistic, okay, yeah, maybe a little bit proud, okay, a bit. Uh, there's the racist thing I talked about. Thieves. This is one of the this is one of the groups. The five words of describing the people who don't, along with gutless, do it for me, um, so on. But there were some really interesting uh, ideas there. So one was one guy was very clever. He did alliteration, barbecues, batch, which is a little house by a little hollow house by a beach, beaches, beer, bush, which was being very cheeky. Um, so yeah, very cool. But that gives you an idea. So insula, right? Yeah. Some other because we're isolated, yeah. we're far away. Um, but the one that's well, the one that was the most common was innovative. Which is something as well I identify myself. Uh, and then the next one was sporty. So if you take all the mentions of sports stuff like rugby and cricket and cricket and sporty and so on, you'll see how how strongly uh, we are oriented to those kinds of endeavours. You know, natural outdoor lifestyle. You know, not overloaded with a lot of of uh, cultural baggage. You know, historical things. It's kind of like get out amongst it and so on. Which one? Which one? Yeah, DL. Yeah. So this one was uh, this was through friends on Facebook. So you know, a bunch of bunch of guys and girls, Kiwis, right, we're all connected on Facebook. Basically, responded to my, my request and gave. A, a, it was quite funny. There's a whole bunch of comments and and jokes amongst everyone, um, but gave, a whole, gave all these words. So this was coming from a bunch of, of friends of, of even some of our mutual friends to a degree. Um, you'll see, obviously, you know, uh, could be a little bit biased one way or the other because it's a small sample set, um, but yeah, that's where it came from. So it was, it's all there on my, on my wall on Facebook. And they are not like people have, have no position, they have no the, the last one. Oh, yeah, now nah. you'll see on the next slide, I'll show you. Yeah, nah, it's so here it is. Here, so here's a little bit of a, a, a test for people, right? So, on the, on the left hand side, you've got Kiwi speak, so you've got yeah, nah. and on the right hand side, you've got You've got the, the the more formal definition of it, and, and perhaps more proper English. So we've got things like munted. So munted means damaged beyond damaged beyond repair. Uh, another one, for example, on the bottom, workable. Uh, workable means very angry. Uh, Pepper said, "We've got sugar." So yeah, now nah. so. Pick one of these words, what are words like? Take a hike. Take a hike. Go away. Go away, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> ripped off. What was ripped off? Ripped off. off. But. What's ripped off? Made to pay too much. Yeah, well done. Okay, very good. Should be right. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll show you the next slide where I've matched these up. Uh, oops, wrong machine. So uh, here you see, like, uh, so yeah, nah, 
it's a non-committal response to something said. So it's like, yeah, no, nah. you know, yeah, no. Nah. It's like doesn't doesn't stick. There's nothing there. So a squiz, you know, take a quick look at something. Swears, dodgy, right? So it's bad or unreliable. So we, you know, there's a whole language here. So I, I see these things, and it makes me makes me laugh. Um, Pepper said. Pepper said. <laughs> in a bad mood. So it's it's quite it's quite cool. Um, and so here's just another a little bit of a, another visual representation of different things. Again, you know, some of these like each of these things. This guy here in the, in the bottom right here is a Maori comedian who was brilliant. Like he was this classic loved by I think pretty much everyone. He he passed away, um, Billy T. James, but he was great. And all these things, you know, end of night out on the TV channel goes off the air. There's this good night Kiwi. There you go, you know, there's this, this, this yeah. things that we that we have. So here we go. This is going to be um, the the Maori culture is becoming more and more actually integrated, more and more part of the everyday life in New Zealand. I, I didn't ever have Maori studies, so I'm not. Uh, so familiar with many of these things, unfortunately, but I really admire the fact that it is becoming more and more, you know, more and more words are entered into our vocabulary and phrases like, you know, the kia kaha, yeah, like be strong, you know, it's like, it's, you know, which is there's some really nice sentiments about stuff. And I've, I've learned many of these words, you know, like kaka papa, which is your genealogy, and mana, which is the power or prestige that a person has. And so there's a whole, you know, different set of different things here. Uh, I'm just going to check out how we're going from time. 45 minutes. Okay. So here's a few of the different, you know, things related to Maori culture as well. So the Marae is like a, an official meeting house. As you can see, it's quite ornate designs. Uh, this is a the sort of nice way of welcoming someone. So instead of shaking hands, you have to write you do a, this honey. And then you've got this hangy, honey. Is better said, honey, uh, which is basically like a, a fire pit. So put hot stones in the bottom, dig a big hole, put hot heated stones in the bottom of it, and then food in baskets and cages, and cover the food, and then the food cooks, and you've got you've got your uh, you got your feast. So I've had a, I've had a few of these. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and some of these things, like I think even mana, I think you. I think mana is a word even used in Hawaii as well. So you can see that. Yeah, so there's, there's a common ancestry amongst amongst things. So this is a, the famous New Zealand's, particularly the rugby team has made it even more famous for this thing called a haka, which is a ceremonial dance or a challenge. And so, you know, it's a posture dance performed by a group. Uh, and it's got you know a lot of vigorous movements and really sometimes really quite strong movements. Sometimes you're stamping your feet or or uh, shouting out things. You know I've got a, on the next slide. I've got a video embedded here, but we couldn't get the sound to go out through. It wasn't being shared properly for whatever reason. I'm going to try again now and see if we manage to. Um, I can hear it here on my thing. Maybe I'll put it here.
a good bit coming. There's a good bit coming, so I'll just keep going for a little bit longer. So there we go. That's, uh, that's one of the hackers, the boys did very well. This has got like 6 million views on YouTube or something kind of thing. So it's um, pretty well. And this is just showing respect for a teacher who passed away. And so the, the teacher, you know, it says, yeah, the teacher died and this is, you know, he's in this coffin in this car. And that was just to show respect and gratitude for, for the teacher. So it's really, it's really powerful and really strong. Like the energies that come are, are really strong with these, with these things. Um, they can do huh? So I'll put another thing to show you soon. They can do, but it's, it's usually much sort of smoother and, and lighter, and you know, still strong, but not in the same, same intensity. So these are different, you know, um, this is from the tree fern, the spiral here. So these different symbolisms and, and things related to the Maori. They often have um, Ponam. So there's jade, which is a green stone, the green stone, which Chinese people actually really um, love as well. Like it's a really important cultural thing for them. And there's a lot of that in New Zealand. And so a lot of Chinese tourists actually buy a lot of green stone uh, items in New Zealand. And so, you know, these are different shapes that you might see around people's necks when you're traveling. Lots of people have these kinds of uh, items hanging around their necks and so on, or tattoos as well to a degree and so forth. So this is the one where you're going to see the ladies, if I can get into it properly as well. So, and you see, but they also do a different kind of things. It's more rhythmical and they've got these, what's called a poi, which is a thing they spin around and, and work with. So it's quite cool. Oops, plan B. I did, I did see that the other day. I'm going to, going to quickly switch to a different screen. We hope I've got a, a uh, the video still waiting there. So this one here. So I had to show you that because that was uh, that was a music that, that was produced decades ago, but it became number one in New Zealand, I think. And uh, I really like it. It's a, I hope it's a really great song. And it's from the Patia Māori Club. So and it's all just in Māori. I don't I never knew what the words meant in song, but um, but I like the, the music. So you see the ladies there spinning the things and the boys, yeah. So they they came to search for. Um, uh, Hark related things on, on YouTube, and you'll see even some at weddings and stuff they'll do it. And so, you sometimes will see, see girls there, even doing it, ladies there at weddings. And so it's pretty cool. So, let me. So, this is just again another visual representation of a whole bunch of stuff related to New Zealand. Um, Australians, if anyone ever watches this, They'll, they'll say that Pavel Logan was Australian, but so documented proof that I've seen at least proves that it was a New Zealand first. Um, and uh, this is this is always just the bro this is just like brothers, like we always tease Australians about stuff, and uh, and vice versa. But we've got kiwis, we've got pawa, which is a shellfish. You know, we've got a lot of cows. We've got even more sheep than cows. I can't believe there's sheep on here somewhere. We've got look at that, of course, the sheep. 
Dave will tell us all about sheep another time, but um, we used to have, was it 100 to 1 in terms of, for every human being we had like 100 sheep, that's how many sheep we had, like now I think it's about 40 to 1, so we've still got like a lot of sheep, um, not as much as Australia in sheer quantity, right, you know, so just to, to remind our dear neighbours of that, but um, Again, another running joke. So, you know, this just shows a whole lot of, of what New Zealand culture is and, and has been over, over the years. Um, so, here's another thing. You know, I was in New Zealand recently and I had a chance to, to chat to a really good friend and we sat down and we're having a, a catch up. And I remembered it once I said, oh, man, I'm going to be doing this presentation about New Zealand and, and I started picking his brain about, well, what do you think? And he, he had, he had a, you know, back and forth about a lot of things. And we sort of come with a list of different ideas around things. So, uh, and I can see he's in myself to a large degree. So, you know, um, hence why I'm sort of putting him here to a degree as well. I, I'm not trying to speak for everyone, but, you know, some people there might recognise these things. So we don't take failure too well. We're not the best losers in the world. We're not the worst losers, but we're not. We're not such good losers. Um, we're too sensitive to criticism. So, you know, we get a criticism, we, you know, we, we fall to pieces a little bit too, too easy. At least, at least I do, and, and sometimes others that I know do. Um, we don't like being told what to do. I maybe I don't feel in this category, but I think this, I actually think this is healthy. I'm going to defend this because I think, I think there's a real danger in, uh, a population that is too conformist. You know, you've got to have a sense of criticism, you've got to determine things for yourself, and likewise, you've got to take responsibility for your own actions. Um, and lots of people don't want to do that. And when you're conforming, you're trying to hide and not express your uniqueness. And, you know, like there's been a lot of studies, for example, in America, like I've written courses on deep repression, and they talk about conformity in middle America was like and continues to be like a massive illness, a massive problem. So I think we need to respect differences. And I think in New Zealand we have had too much, uh, there's still too much bullying, there's still way too much uh, suicide amongst young people. And, and I, it's just such a shame because it's, it's not needed. We just need to give the space for people to, to express themselves and be who they are and to be okay with that. And I don't think that that exists enough yet. Hopefully we're getting better and hopefully we can continue to improve on those things and, and contribute in some way positively to make those changes. Um, so then moving on, you know, like, so there's one good thing we don't do, when others make mistakes, we don't celebrate those mistakes, right? So some people will know when the opposition, if you're watching, if you're watching football or soccer and the other team makes mistakes, like a mistake, you know, often your supporters cheer because, yeah, they made a mistake. New Zealanders, we don't really like that, and, uh, and I think that's a really positive thing. Um, you know, like I think we're aware of our own mistakes, perhaps too much, um, but it's great that we don't celebrate others' mistakes. Uh, in general, obviously there can be exceptions. I'm, I'm not sure. I think you know, uh, in general, we're courageous and uh, and and my mate there, he made his comment. You know, we're a hardy bunch. Like we have this expression. And the rugby field, you've been playing a guy who's huge and you've got to try to tackle him, you've got to try to get him on the ground. And so we have this expression, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But just try, try to help the little guys to go, yeah, go and tackle that massive monster there. <laughs> and, and I remember as a young guy, there was a massive friend of mine who's a huge, I think, Samoan or partner guy, I don't know, Simon what your heritage is there, exactly, a massive guy. And so I was trying to follow this principle when uh, the last minute of the game, we'd already lost by like 30 points or something, but he had the ball and was just running straight at me and I was like, well, what are you going to do? You know, we got to try. <laughs> I think I slowed him down was about the best I could say. And I was just a full on bang down on the ground and pretty much just trampled over me and kept on running. But, uh, you know, got to give it a, got to give it a try. 
And I've seen it do this to other guys as well, just to make myself feel a little bit better. I've seen a, a six foot five guy do a somersault backwards after he tried to take him, so get in his way. So a huge and powerful guy. Anyway, I digress. Um, I think we have a lot of resiliency and, uh, and Kiwis, are, we're good at facing challenges and we have to be. And we have, uh, you know, a lot of tenacity. We keep going, we keep sticking at it. We try, we keep going until we, we get there typically. Um, we have a lot of integrity. We respect competitors, we respect hard work and we respect people who, who are giving things a go. And so there's been really positive things here. And one lovely thing about the culture as well is that we, we're travelers. We're an island nation. If we weren't travellers, we wouldn't we wouldn't know anything. And so it's really traditional in New Zealand, uh, I guess until today, it certainly was in my time, where everyone goes and has an OE. An OE stands for overseas experience. You go overseas, you live overseas, you travel, whether it's with a backpack or you permanently go and live in the UK for a couple of years and so on, or, or wherever it was. And so it's a great part of, of the, the culture and that helps us to mature and to have a much broader frame of reference for, for life there. And sometimes even take the best things from other places and try to bring them into your own culture. Build those good things in your own culture. So a little bit more of the nature side of things here. You know, the birds, the insects, the flora, sorry, the fauna. And then some of these views, some of these uh, these presentations here. A little bit more, and I've really I've loved these retro kinds of posters that, that they're starting to produce and you can see more and more. And you also can see you've got um, another bunch of, of stuff here. So Jaffers, it's kind of sweet, uh, candy, chocolate on the inside. And, and uh, orange on the outside, the kiwi foods, the hokey pokey ice cream, you know, double cone, right? And these are classic gumboots for farmers, red band gumboots. So all these things are classic kind of kiwi, kiwi things. Again, the tomato sauce bottle, the beer, more sweets, jandals, rugby, chocolate fish, which I enjoyed a number of the other day. We have loaf again, our famous national dessert. Sorry, Australians, but you know, that's what it is. And so forth. So, oh yes, there's another video. There we go. So, uh, and just to give a bit of background and context here. So, the um, the New Zealand advertising industry is like really well known for its um, its sort of offbeat humour. Like they just are really creative. And, uh, and it's something to be admired. So here's, here's a little, this is about nine minutes of them and I'm gonna show just one, maybe two. The second one's a little bit risque in parts, but uh, we'll see how we go. Here we go. And it's advertising. And it's advertising a car. <laughs> I love it. It's like the cars are the afterthought. Um, and this one it might be a little bit harder to understand, but you, 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 some of you will get a laugh. <laughs> Features included a handy front key pocket, although no key could fit in it, which was cool because 
back then, well, people just left their keys in the car anyway. Now, any social occasion with one men could feel comfortable in as they drank their L and P while their mullets sheltered their necks from the long summer sun that burned on and on. You were there, and so was L and P. Well, famous in New Zealand since ages ago. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't stop laughing. <laughs> so, so, you know, sometimes the best part of the TV are the advancements. Um, <laughs> so, there's a couple of girls who hang around with us laughing their heads off. Um, yeah, but that's, that's the reality, right? It's great stuff. Hilarious. So, uh, and it goes on from there, like, there's this that answer is strong. So, um, good friends, everyone out there who's going to see us again in some of the future, there's questions. You might need to come closer to the microphone. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like you to tell us about a, a political issues, for example, a, have been a, any worse? Obviously, you've been from in England mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you can talk about this political issues and wars. Um, sure. So we're going to talk about the serious stuff now. <laughs> um, so we haven't provoked any wars ourselves. <laughs> There's no one to fight with. You know? There's just whales and stuff. Um, but we have been involved in a number of wars. We usually uh, uh, we're really supported the, um, the the British Empire for a long time. Um, so the things they were involved in World War One, World War Two, we're, we're very well known for uh, fighting and being a part of of those endeavours. Um, sometimes terribly managed by the British commanders, like Gallipoli, for example, was like a, a massacre. Um, that's in somewhere in, in Turkey. And um, there's also, you know, there's also been military alliances, so we're politically, geopolitically, we're very aligned with um, the United States and Australia. And um, and that's really been the, the that, from a military Point of view. So sometimes they've been involved in in conflicts or reconstructing things after wars. Like you know, not necessarily um, send a lot of troops to things. We don't often have a lot of troops to send. But um, you know, the Gulf Wars and stuff like that, where there's general UN consensus approving things, we tend to operate in those kinds of areas. Um, politically, New Zealand. We, we made a change to the way we voted for our politicians back when I was at university. So, yeah, what was that? Early 90s, uh, 1990s, late 1980s kind of a thing. We went to a thing called, we, we went previously first past the post. So what that means is whoever gets the most votes wins and that's it and they're the, they're the boss. And so we went, I actually voted for a change uh, to, I think it's called mixed member proportional system. <clears throat> so my great idealistic wish was that um, the politicians would stop being so stupid and start to work together for the betterment of the country as opposed to just the, being based on party lines, being based more on policy lines and what is best for the most people. That was my wish for why I voted for that particular system. So. It's created a different environment politically, though. So you get greater diversity of representation. You get lots more parties in, in government now. Um, but we also have in this, the current government, we have a situation where what happened is the, the party who individually gained the most votes isn't actually in parliament. They couldn't form a government. So the, the, the grouping that managed to get enough seats in the parliament to be the ones who are responsible was the Labour Party with partners with New Zealand First and the Green Party. So, and this is, it's interesting. I mean, it's just an interesting outcome. And I kind of like it because I think we're getting way too capitalist, way too money, money oriented, way too grabby and just, and so we've kind of got a mixture now where they're, they're, they're more humane 
then the economy's still been trucking along and doing pretty well. So, um, you know, no government is perfect, no government makes all the correct decisions, but they've, they've you know, they've, they've made some nice changes and, and efforts. So you've got to try different things to get different outcomes and, and see. So anyway, so it's a different kind of environment um, in, that, in that regard. Um, yeah. Question, uh, Another question. So if you have a hypothesis, why were you born in New Zealand? My hypothesis, she asked yeah. a complicated question. Why was I born in New Zealand? Um, well, I think it is, I mean, I've got to admit, I acknowledge the obvious, you know, it's an English speaking country. It's, um, it's in a part of the world geographically that is interesting. Uh, it's a new world country, it's not an old world country. I wasn't born in England. Uh, and also, I wasn't born in Australia or in America, you know. So, there were certain things in my culture which were going to be inevitable, you know. Perhaps the group, the family that I was born into, uh, is an important part of why I was born in New Zealand. There's, there's certain things there to work together. Uh, my sister, for example, also is seems to be what you know, we call an intermissivist, someone who looks to have had an intermissive course. So there's a group there, like a synergy in terms of activities and, and chances of, of, of working together towards certain things, along with other friends who I have confident, confidence are in the same kind of, of uh, thing. So for me, an obvious answer would be, you know, and, and knowing my work and what I've done within potentiology and a lot of translating books into English, being a bridge, being an international voice, uh, within consensuality to try to internationalize it, to try to uh, it be better understood and more widely understood, I think uh, are major components to that. Um, and I think New Zealand gave me a lovely, safe environment to be brought up in. That's not to say that uh, there wasn't traumas and there wasn't issues and there wasn't schoolyard bullying, whether it was done to me or on some occasions, unfortunately, I did that to other people in some ways. Um, you know, but it's a safe place. Like you, people go on holiday or used to, and more, but some people still do, go on holiday and they leave their houses unlocked. Like in one of those videos we saw, you leave the keys in the car, you go to the shop and you leave the keys in the car, like, you know, like safe, like what a lovely place to be where you can trust other people around you and you, you have that sense of security. Um, but also the isolationism, like in the OE thing, so there, there was you'd be guaranteed that I could be born there and I was going to go overseas. So you, you're 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 invited to go overseas. Uh, I mean, physically, there's certain things that I needed to learn um, growing up with, you know, how to handle certain things, and and there was was a good environment for those sorts of things as well, you know, to to learn how to. to to be involved with sports teams, to do certain things, to to, to 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 get on with different people and different relationships and different, you know, like, and it's very, oh, one great thing. It's a very horizontal society. So I remember when I was a small kid, like, you know, I'd go and play at, at friends' houses. And we, were, we, we lived in a really lovely house, like, it seemed, it seemed in my mind so huge back then, you know, I see it now, it's like, oh, it's not that big, but, mm -hmm. but we're going friends who were in a really simple house, we were in a small, simple house, kind of, kind of ugly, it wasn't beautiful like ours, I didn't really understand all, but I didn't care, like there's no stigmatization between, at least in my world, between different groups, I had friends, guys who were, who were, who were from the islands, who were close friends, who I really admired and respected, and so there's lovely horizontality and uh and kind of equality and fairness between between people that's it's not always like that i'm not saying that should have you know i shouldn't have i shouldn't have done more in terms of, of reaching out to more groups but if we have a real openness about us i think to to interact with, with whoever you know we, we don't, we're not very pompous or uh, or um we don't really work with a sense of superiority we don't really have that so it probably helped me in a lot of ways as well you know so there's obviously challenges you grow you learn um but yeah and a fantastic education system as well fantastic health system fantastic education system the quality of life in new zealand is is, is really really high you know so 
Yeah. Other questions, dear people out there? Christoph, we can see you working away in the background there. Hope you're well. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? If you if you want to speak, just unmute yourselves and go ahead, or type in a question if you've got any other thoughts. We can watch the other seven or eight minutes of those those uh, those funny videos if you want, but otherwise. Australia's yeah. uh, yeah. when you were. I've lived there on a couple of different occasions. So when you were uh, how old? I was, in, I was no I was, in, I was a young I was a young adult, like 26, 27, so or, and then uh, yeah, around there. Um, so I did it when I was even younger, like twenty four, and I I was zero game when I was like thirty kind of thing. So the Holocene, the difference between the Holocene, so the environment, the energies, the sentiments and the, and the places, the difference between Australia and New Zealand, you know, like, um, and this, this comes to a theme of study that I like, it's called, it's, it's evolutionary geography. Uh, so this, this discusses the different impacts that the geography has on the evolution of the people who are living in those areas. So Australia, you know, it's not like an abundant land. It's huge and there's a lot of mineral resources, but it's very dry. There's a lot of sunshine. Um, there's not a lot of variety. I mean, there, there is and there's not, you know, but it's because it's so big, you get some tropical forest in the north and then, but most of it's desert. So it's very arid and dry. So, it's, and there's a lot of poisonous, poisonous creatures like we talked about. So there's a lot of, um, things in the environment that make it slightly harder, it's a slightly harder edge to live in. Whereas New Zealand's kind of, at least nowadays, uh, more of a softer place to live, right? So it's more Pacific, it's more relaxed, uh, more laid, even more laid back. The sense of humor between Aussies and Kiwis is quite, is quite similar, but I find the Australian sense of humor to be a little bit more, um, Aggressive, I suppose you could say, and so both cultures have aggressive sides to them. But I think the Aussies probably take the edge on just the hardcore nature a little bit more so than the Kiwis do. And that, in part, it's probably because of the the environment that they they have to deal with. They live in it's harder. How to connected to our community? You feel? Have you ever had this connection, the statistical thing, what kind of characteristics do you... Yeah, so, visiting, I had lots of projections there, you know, but what I can say is when I was giving classes in New Zealand, giving courses in Conscientiology, the Science of Consciousness in New Zealand, um, so I could perceive the extra-physical consciousness is connected or present there, were of Maori or Polynesian nature, more so. So we had five students, not one was a native New Zealander. So we had people from like Russia and Mexico and Spain and other places, but no native New Zealanders, uh, no Maoris and no, no Pakehas like, like myself. But extra physically, they, they were present. There was Polynesian, you know, island guys, extra physical consciousness is there. And they were doing a good effort to understand and incorporate and integrate the knowledge, the experiences that were being explained in the classroom into their, into their minds. But they have a very strong presence energetically, right? So that they have quite a, 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 a palpable uh, presence. Um, so in terms, I don't know, maybe Dave, if you're there and you want to you talk to this, maybe you've had some experiences, I think maybe on your farm you mentioned some things there related to the Maoris and other cultures, I don't know if you're in a place where you can talk at the moment, but if you want to, feel free to, to jump in. I'm not sure it's going to come through, I'm not hearing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? 
Good day. Hey, hello. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, good to see you too, fella. Yeah, good. No, all very interesting. I mean, I, I would say that um, I think that's definitely a key part of the extra physical aspect of New Zealand is the Maori, you know, tradition and the fact that they've been there for so long. Um, you know, I've had some, you know, experiences in the in the forest walking around and, you know, there's no one there physically, but then sort of getting this sense and, you know, that there were sort of extra physically Maori people still there, you know, taking care of things. And I've had different experiences being near a marae and sort of having this strong sense of some sort of energetic, you know, force being maintained there you know, actively in some way um, so yeah definitely that I think that's there and it's interesting in terms of the um, in terms of the traits that you were talking about before um, I actually helped here in the Washington area recently with a hungi so they had a bit of hungi that they put on the, a group um, for about three or four hundred you know local people that you wow. know, are either from New Zealand or you know have got you know the, maybe the wife or the husband is from New Zealand and you know they've got a connection um, and it was kind of cool because it was mainly Maori people and, and Pacific Island people, especially Samoans that were running the hungi. Yep. And so I was one of the few Pakehas involved in it. Um, and it was actually really nice in terms of those values. Like I think that softness, that gentleness yeah. um, really came through, you know. Um, and it was actually quite lovely to sort of see that, you know, more of that side of things, you know, rather than kind of the, I think us Pakehas are a bit kind of, you know, we're still, still pretty Too soft, a bit, a bit Too rough, English right? still. Yeah. yeah, so it was actually kind of nice to sort of see that holistic view of New Zealand society, you know, through through that lens. And that reminds me, like, I remember arriving in the airport in New Zealand, and you're just walking through the thing, and people just look at you in the eye and smile and say hello, and out of the blue, and I was like, oh, man, how yeah, yeah, nice, how friendly, you know, like, and in lots of other countries, that just is never going to happen, you know, like, it just doesn't happen. So, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, and just to sort of think the main original question, I think definitely there's, um, you know, there's still some extra physical, you know, not exactly roughness, but, you know, there, in some cases, yes, you know, there were a lot of wars, um, yeah. you know, both before the whites came, but then after the whites came, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's beautiful naturally, um, but sometimes, you know, there are some pockets that the energies aren't as smooth as all that, and there's a yeah, you know, a few things, you know, and I've even got some theories which I still need to prove out. So, you know, don't don't say, oh, this is a true thing. But I kind of wonder if some of us that went to New Zealand were kind of a little bit like a mini, like, tele, you know, um, more of a, yeah, you know, not so much a transmigration, <laughs> like a, <laughs> but uh, certainly a, uh, you know, some sort of, hey, let's get these guys off to the side so they can do a bit less damage. You know, a pre-transmigration. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, more I'm thinking in terms of the initial waves of the Maori, you know, people and so on, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I've heard, I've heard some stories from some um, some friends who, who have better historical knowledge on, on the Maori intertribal behaviour prior to you know their the colonisation and so on. And yeah, it's like pretty pretty brutal and, and hardcore core stuff in terms of you know young children just. Finishing every, just finishing everything, kind of thing, you know, and, and then the the, the reorganisation, extra physically that needs to be done, and energetically, yeah, it's a lot, still a lot of cleaning probably to be done in certain ways. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for your input, big guy. Anyone else got any questions or thoughts about about it all? Oh yeah, we've got energy exercise. So, if there's no other questions, guys, we'll, um, we'll, we'll wrap up by doing like a, a bit of energy work. So, energy work, for those of you who see this video later, is really easy. Energy follows your attention or your concentration. So, you don't need to imagine or visualize it. You just decide, put your attention, your concentration, and energy will flow. So, if I concentrate on the end of my finger, energy will concentrate there. If I want to move energy up and down through my body, I just concentrate on moving the energy and it will move. So it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy. So that's the basis behind these exercises, okay? Just your willpower, your decision. So just basically just relax and uh, get comfortable in your chair and take a couple of deeper breaths to help you relax. 
but stay lucid. Don't try to lose, you know, lucidity. And now start to accumulate your energy in the top of your head and above your head. Create like a plane of energy around your head, slightly above your head. Just through your decision and your willpower and applying your concentration. And now while relaxing your body deeply, start to move your energy down through your body, slowly and firmly. Push your energy through every part of your body. You may lose track of it at some moment, but just insist and persist. Keep going. Move your energy. Move it down to below your feet and then start to bring it back up. So do this closed circulation of your energy. Intensify the movement. Intensify it by increasing your concentration and increasing the amount of energy that moves with you, moving the energy up and down. And really accelerate, begin to accelerate the movement of the energy. Move it faster and faster. And try to reach the condition which is called the vibrational state where all your energies start to vibrate and expand on their own account. So your energetic field starts to expand and sort of get reinforced and strengthened through the exercise. If you lose your concentration, just start at the beginning again and start to circulate your energy up and down. Now start to exteriorize your energy. So release your energy from you into the environment around you. Use your willpower and just release the energy. Send out wave after wave of energy to the environment. And try to put your best thoughts and your best emotions into your energy. This helps to clean yourselves and to clean your environment. Send energy in every direction. Try to feel the changes in your body as you do these exercises. Send energy particularly out through the nipple chakra here in the base of your neck, send it out, and also through your umbilical chakra in your stomach region. Start to send energy out primarily through those chakras, those areas of your bodies. Okay, diminish the exteriorization and uh, feel free to start to open your eyes, move your body slowly and gently. Start to reconnect. Sometimes when you do those exercises, you disconnect your bodies a little bit and you can feel a little bit dizzy or lightheaded. So just make sure you've got 
yourself back in full control of your body again. And uh, guys, thank you very much for your participation. There's one thing, an activity that I'd probably like to share with you. There's uh, a new project called the Bridge Book Club. And the first book is going to be studied, which is called the 700 Consensuology Experiments. And there's a website for that. So if you're interested, go to uh, bridgebookclub.isicons.org and you'll get information there about, uh, about those activities. So again, it's bridgebookclub.isicons.org and that's going to be activities and books, different ones going forward from, for, from now on. And there's other bridge activities coming up as well and that you're going to be finding out about shortly. So, um, you know, all the best for your studies and uh, Look forward to seeing you again in, in the future. Anything else for Jenny you want to share with anyone? Thank you very much. It was great your presentation. And we're looking forward for the next year with new activities in the Great Factor. That's it. That's it, guys. Take care. All the best until next time. See you around. Thanks, Jeff.